So I'm Kim Wright, and uh, these are the Society 2045 Friday Talks. They're interviews with people worldwide, creating a better future through social movements and thought leadership. And we aim to bring together the different thinkers and social movements across various disciplines to co-create a broader and more cohesive vision for the year 2045. Um, we have a, a collective vision of what it could be like, but we wanna add yours. And we can create a more robust voice for change by bringing together adjacent movements and thought leaders. So I'm going to start as we usually do by having you introduce yourself and tell us what you, what we should know about you. And you can take a couple of minutes to do that so we can kind of get a feel of, of what you're up to in the world. And then I have a few questions of my own and a few questions that are sort of our standard questions. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's awesome to be here. I really appreciate it. Um, Quivers Oosthuizen is how you would pronounce it. It's a very Dutch, original Dutch surname, but you know all the Dutch kind of settled here in in uh, or many in South Africa. And so Quivers is a very Afrikaans name. So my first language is Afrikaans. Um, I lived in the southern suburbs or the southern South Peninsula. We actually call it of Cape Town. Um, and so it's a it's a very weird community I live in. It's very English, but then there's this pocket of Afrikaans speaking people, very small. And then we've got a big a Klosa, is it Klosa group of people? We've got Zulu, Suswana, and then obviously uh, just from the whole of Africa, many Malawians living here, Mozambique, Zimbabweans, Namibians, uh, and so uh, it's, it's just a very diverse community. And I think in that diversity, obviously, there's often a lot of stresses and, and pressures. Uh, and especially if you consider South Africa's past, you know, with, with apartheid. And so it's a, it's a very dynamic, diverse community that I live in. And Quivers himself, I went on this journey, or maybe I should just say I'm happily married with a beautiful daughter. She's 13. I always say she's my living experiment. I always try things out on her. I will tell you how she turns out when she's 16. Um, <laughs> but I always test all my thinking on her. Um, and uh, I think that the biggest thing about me or my journey, years ago, I went on this journey to really just understand change. I think that was the big thing for me. Um, and it is, why do we why do we struggle so much with change? And you often hear this, you know, people say, well, the one thing that's evident is change and everything is changing around us. And that is such a weird paradox for me because in one sense, yes, everything is changing. But in the other sense, we are still using a wheel. It freaks me out that we are using a thing that was invented 300,000 years BC and we're not, and we just, changing it a little bit to make it more dynamic, more, you know, roadworthy, more whatever, but we're still using that round thing. And so in a weird sense, change is happening, and yet it is also not happening at the same time. At a stage, I don't know if any one of you work for Gillette, the razor blade guys, <laughs> so if I, you know, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but, but I once just looked at how the razor blade progressed through the years. And so, you know, you had that, uh, the, the first disposable blade was that menorah blade that you put in, a, you know, and you kind of throw it away when you're done. And then they came out with a, the disposable razor and then a big breakthrough moment. They added another blade and then there were two blades. And then a, a big breakthrough moment, they added a third blade. And a couple of years later, a fourth blade and yeah yeah exactly do you know that uh, i actually steward i actually saw a razor blade with 12 blades <laughs> it is insane and so my thinking is where do we get to a stage where we just drink a pull and our beards will shoot off our face or you drink a goatee pull you know and you have a beautiful goatee or something and so it's weird we we see this change on the one side and then we just see the changes often not it's often not even a new idea. It's just kind of tweaking the current idea. Anyway, so I'm just fascinated with change and I'm fascinated about what our brains do with change. Uh, why on the 1st of January, 2023, we will stand there and go like, this is the year, this year I want to change, you know? And, and then, you know, a couple of months down the line, we, we forgot about the things that we wanted to change. And so my world started off 
by looking at neuroscience and change. And, um, and, uh, and I decided in the beginning phases of my, of my journey about understanding how the mind works um, to really test change on a, on a radic in a radical way. And so I, I went to a police station in Cape Town um, and I asked for the name of three gangsters. I said, like, can you give me the names of three gangsters? And they, that's not in prison. And they said, yes. And they gave me three names. And I said, where can we find them? And they said, you don't want to find them. I said, I want to find them. And we, we literally decided to, to see what we can do with three gangsters. If, if we can cause any change in their lives. That, that was the, the big drive. And um, I'll, I'll never, so with gangsterism is big in, in certain areas of Cape Town. So people always ask me why gangsters quivers, and I said, well, we produce them here, so there's many. Um, and I and I literally drove up to, I found these three guys, and I and I said, hey guys, uh, uh, we are an extreme sports company. We want to throw people out of planes and all sorts of stuff, and we need some people that's tough, you know, not afraid. And I got your names and. Are you in? Are you willing to go on this journey with us? And that's kind of how my journey started, just to see how can we cause change in people's lives that's actually in a space that they need it, but they don't really want it. They're happy with where they were at. So that's where it started. Um, and within six months, we just saw just tremendous things shift in their lives. And today, I mean, today, that was 2007, so it is quite a long time ago. But the three guys we started off with, one of them is a senior manager at a huge commercial diving school. It was this big dream that developed. And another guy's got his own roofing company. And, and it was actually spectacular. I'm still good friends with him to see how the, you know, how, how, you, you, how change is possible, real change is possible. And then I got a call from a, from a company in Port Elizabeth. Now that well, they just changed the name to Kubeja. Um, but it sits on our east coast, very nice little town. It's called it's also called the Windy City. And I got a call from a CEO of a big agricultural company. They got 3,000 staff. And he says, Kubus, can you come? Oh, we saw something on the television about what you guys are doing. And can you come to visit us? And I, and I flew up there and I, and I sat there. He said, we want in our company what you guys are doing in the community. And at that stage, I was, I was like, I'm such not a business person. You know, like the corporate world doesn't interest me at all. And so I just shared with him a few things. And I, and I left that and I came back to Cape Town. And he phoned me again. He said, I want you to become involved in the company. And I told him this time, I said, look, there's nothing that you can tell me that will convince me to get involved in the corporate world. I said, I'm not, that's not my world. I said, you know, I just leave me with my gangsters. And then he turned to me and he said, well, that's why I need you. He said, our managers are just like gangsters. And I'm like, say what? And he said, yeah, I, I, they, they use fear and the manipulation. And I got so intrigued that I said, okay, I'll be back next week. I want to kind of research this. I want to see if there's any correlation. And I fell in love with the corporate sector. I fell in love with people sitting in systems um, that feel stuck in the system, but they don't know if there's anything better for them. They, they, they think that this is the world. You know, in this world, there is the boss. You know, he sits there. And if I do the right moves at the right time, things might go well with me. If I do the wrong moves, and this is gangster thinking at the wrong time, this might be my end. And I just realized how similar just all people are. And doesn't matter in what context you find, find yourself. Um, and so today, I, I live in two worlds. <laughs> I will sit with the CEO of a huge international corporate, and then I will get on my car and drive to a gangster <laughs> and speak to him. So we've got two companies, two organizations, one focus on social development, and one focuses on, on company culture and employee engagement. And both, they are both rooted in our understanding of how our minds work. And what we need to, uh, I guess, move through real change. And yeah, and that's me. Uh, and uh, absolutely love getting up in the morning. Um, and I uh, just love what I do. Yeah. So um, that's a great story. I want to go back because I'm still back at, uh, at the inquiry that you started with 
and and the experiments you've been doing. So why do we struggle with change? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Maybe that gets to us. So so here's the weird thing about how our brains work. In a in a nutshell. Our brain has two main functions. And the one function, the main function, is to keep you alive at all costs. So, so when if we could ask the brain, why do you exist? It will say, it's to keep you alive at all costs. Now, to do that, it your brain doesn't necessarily think in terms of right or wrong or good or bad. You know, it, it doesn't think that way. It thinks in terms of difference. So what he tries to do is if he established your environment and he established uh, what's normal to you, it then starts picking up on differences. And he doesn't like differences because he knows like at the moment we're all sitting here, we are pretty safe. And so if anything is now out of the norm, then he will go, like, oh, maybe you're in danger. So it always tries to bring you back to what is normal to you, even if your normal is detrimental to you. Uh, and so it doesn't ask, is this good or bad for you? It's just like, is this normal to you? And if you say yes, then I say, okay, right. And now if it picks up a change, it goes like, well, whoa, 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 you might be a problem. So on the 1st of January, my normal is my current weight, even like I don't want to be that weight, or maybe my, the, my, uh, my health, and maybe I don't want to be like that, but that's what my brain is used to. And now on the 1st of January, I say, okay, this year, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign up at the gym. I'm going to eat healthy. I'm going to stop this. And the brain goes like, oh, wait, 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 wait. That's not normal. <laughs> it says, I pick up a difference in your thinking. And if I'm going to allow for differences in your life, uh, then you might sit with a mental disorder. And so how do I, for lack of a better word, sabotage, sabotage that to bring you back to normal. And so now your brain starts working. He says, hey, Quivers, you said on the 1st of January, right? But your family is still there. So you can't really start on the 1st of January. It's still a little bit of holiday season. So you know what? Maybe next week, you know, and now your brain comes back to normal. And this is, you, I'll tell you what, when the kids go back to school and everything is back to normal, then... And so now we start losing our energy to, to make that change. And then we're just back to the old selves. And I think that is the, the biggest struggle with change. I took guys off the street for one of my experiments. Uh, it was, uh, I, I interviewed a, a bunch of guys. And in South Africa, if you Google South Africa biggest needs now, that it will pop up employment. Employment is the biggest need in South Africa. So I, I went with that. I said, okay, let's work with the biggest need in South Africa, and that is our unemployment rate, which is very high. So I go and find people that live literally on the street under a bush. And I, and I ask them, uh, what do you believe you need to change your life? And to some people, you know, they gave me all different answers. But then I grouped uh, a few of them that said, if I get a job, my life will change. Forever, my life will change. And so I said, all right. And so even out of that group, we narrowed it down to six guys because they actually had an idea as to what they wanted to do. The one guy said, oh, man, my, my uncle was a painter. So if I can, I know how to paint. So if I can just get into painting houses, that will change my life. And the other one said a builder. The other one said a mechanic. And so we grouped them together, the six of them. And then we find them, we cleaned them up took them off the streets, gave them clothing, put them in a shelter uh, where they had a bed and food. And then we gave them the actual jobs they wanted. So we got them into, uh, and we said, all that we want to do from a research point of view is keep track as to how your lives would change. That's it. Kim, six weeks, six weeks. And all of them were back on the street under a bush. And we were like, what? how is this possible? I thought this is what you need for your life to change. But you see, if my belief, if my normal is, I am a useless, homeless, good for nothing person, and we cause a radical change in your life, your brain says we call it dissonance with, with that stress. And now it says, I want to, I, I need to get out of this. And then we start sabotaging ourselves often to just get back to what is our normal. And so 
true change comes when beliefs start shifting inside of us. When, when the way we see ourselves, the way we see the world really starts shifting. And uh, Frederick Lou, uh, he in his book, he said, uh, he said to uh, a breakthrough moment is frightening and liberating at the same time. And I absolutely love it. It's frightening and liberating at the same time because it's frightening because your brain struggles with this, this you know, this, this dissonance and yet it's liberating if you can push through that and, and see the change. Oh man, I wish I had six months with you to explain this in detail, but I hope that makes a little bit of sense. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. So what I'm thinking is, is I, I'm one of those people that tolerates a lot of change. I got one of the things I jokingly say is that I don't know where I left my comfort zone. It's been so long since I've seen it. Yeah. And and what is that? Like yeah. like this, the, you know, like some people are more tolerant than others. What do you think that is? Yeah. Oh man. So so I love the fact that you use comfort zone. Because what we know is our comfort zone is the place where our brain actually allows for small differences, you know. So, so it is, is that is that space where um, I can do slightly better or slightly worse, but as soon as my brain picks up a major difference, you know, like way better, way worse, then we talk about self-regulation. It, you know, it wants to push us back. And I think what I've seen with uh, how can I put this nicely? With mature people is the word I want to use. With people that kind of old. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. No, no, that was not my thinking. No, no I'm, I'm thinking literally. Okay. It's okay. We all we all uh, cop to that here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm really thinking mature in the sense of I, I want to say spiritually mature, but that's not even I don't, I don't know what the right word is. Uh, people that's gone on a journey to start really seeing that life is more than just themselves allows for the brain to, to go like, hey, that space of a little bit better, a little bit worse, we can actually start stretching that, you know, um, because in the beginning, it's just about keeping me normal, normal, normal. But now uh, it's that space of, it is okay to see these differences. It doesn't threaten me. I, I guess that's the big thing. In the beginning, our brain is so threatened by changes. But the more we can teach it that the changes is not threatening, it's okay, it is fine, uh, the more it allows. And I love the fact that you use that word comfort zone because it literally starts stretching the comfort zone to say, you know, maybe still if someone knocks on the door with a nuclear bomb, you'll go like, hey, I'm not ready for this. Well, what, what's happening over here? You know, because it will pick up this, but, but it, it will just allow for more uh, because the brain is not threatened anymore. Uh, and, and I think that is something, and I, I often, and I really, I really, I don't attach age to it at all, uh, because you can get a mature <laughs> six-year-old, okay. yeah. six um, but there is definitely something about feeling less threatened, I guess, that allows us to, to move into that space, yeah. So it reminds me, my six-year-old grandson has been here this week. And he actually told his cousin, I'm not really afraid of anything. He said, fear, this is six years old, he said, fear is a cage. And uh, if I am afraid, I am in the cage. And if I face my fears, I can get out of the cage. Six-year-old philosopher. And, um, and one of the things I notice about him is that his, my son is an excellent father. His parents don't live together. I assume his mother is also an excellent mother because he has such a confidence and security i mean like he, i i would say he's well attached mm. and i wonder mm. if that has something to do with it as well absolutely absolutely so uh, when we look at attachment theory for example uh, so so there's uh, i think it, it, it must be american or maybe canadian i don't know there was a, a doctor uh, Scott Larson, a Dr. Brentro, and a Dr. Broken Leg. That was the guy's name, Dr. Broken Leg. And he was a Native American Indian. I don't know what is the, the culturally correct word to use, but anyway, that's, an, that's, what, uh, that's how I look, got to know him. And they worked on um, resilience. And so they said, like, uh, uh, how do we, 
how do we instill resilience in, in people? Now there are different models, you know, but I love their model. And, and they say that resilience starts with a sense of attachment or a sense of belonging. And they say, if a child feels that they belong or they, they feel really attached and they feel safe, they will, start feel, they will feel safe enough to go and try things. Because if they don't feel safe, they will avoid doing anything that could, you know, cause people to say, hey, that's wrong, that's bad, whatever. Um, so often when I walk into a house and they sort of a, a kid, you know, and they're also so sweet and quiet, I don't know, there's something wrong with that kid, you know, <laughs> the kid is afraid. It's the, it's the child that want to stick their fingers in the wall sockets, you know, with this electricity and put stuff in their mouths and climb up stuff. That's a very healthy kid, unfortunately, because they believe that the world is a safe place. And once they believe it's a safe place, often what happens then is they, they are keen and willing to go and try stuff. And so we say it starts with belonging, but it then goes over into mastery. And the mastery is this then believing that they can achieve, they can do. And as soon as they start believing that they can achieve and do stuff, that spills over into independence where they can start making their own good decisions. And then as soon as they say, like, hey, I can see how my decisions impact the world, then that goes back to what we call generosity, where they are actually seeing that, that what they do can do good to other people as well. Um, and so this whole journey often starts with just that sense of a person feeling attached or they feel they belong now coming back to my gangsters well, it sounds terrible when i say my gangsters my young people at risk that i work with um often that's that that is the problem there is no sense of belonging there's no sense of attachment and so then it's followed by a huge sense of fear for the world and not an understanding of fear and fear really inhibits our potential if I take a plank and I, you know, it's this wide and it's this thick and I make it three meters wide and I put it between two chairs and I say, hey, Mark, will you walk over this chair? If you, uh, sorry, over this plank. I mean, it's just this high of the floor. If you walk over and you get to the other side, I will give you a thousand dollars. What do you think? You know, what do you do? And Mark will go like, yeah, obviously I will do this. You know, he's got the balance to do it. So he will get on the plank. It will take a few steps, he will turn around, he will walk backwards, he will hang his leg off the side. If you can, if you can walk, you can do that, all right? You can walk over that plank. If we take that same plank and we lift it 20 stories high and I put it between two buildings and I say, hey, Mark, if you walk over the plank, I'll give you $1,000. If you fall off, you don't get it. The question is, will you still want to do that? And most likely people say, no, 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 you know, maybe I'm not so keen to do it. But if you think logically about it, it's the, it's the same width, it's the same length, it's the same balance. There is no difference in your ability. But as soon as fear kicks in, if fear kicks in, it inhibits our potential, it, it stops us from operating in a logic way, because once again, the brain picks up fear and says, oh, get out of this, get out of this, don't get on that plank, even though you can do it, get out of that. And, and I think what your, what that six-year-old boy said was so, so powerful, because if you can just get a grip of fear, you're already widening that, that box, you know, uh, yeah, it's very powerful. So I'm going to switch to some of our questions that we ask everyone. And now uh, the, the first one is, what is, what is your vision for 2045? So I had to work it out. You know? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm so sure she might ask this. So where will I be in 2045? <laughs> um, oh, man, sheesh. So, so I, I, when, we, when you started the conversation, uh, you, you used the word co-create. And that's actually part of our company's vision. We, we talk about, uh, we co-create a world of healthy connections. And, and we absolutely believe that that is what the world needs, is healthy connections. And we don't create, but we will co-create. We will take hands with other people to do it. And I think if I want, if I'm in, in the year 2045, I would really, really love to see a world with better, and healthier connections um, and 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 i don't think it's impossible 
I think it is very, very possible. I mean, Kim, I, I mean, I don't know the rest of the people on the screen. I probably know you best of all. I don't even know you that well. But just looking at the work that you've been doing, I'm like, that is it. That is co-creating a world where there will be healthier, better connections. And I look at what our team is doing, and I, and I see a, a, a lot of what other people are doing, and I say it is possible to see this world where there's healthier connections. And um. Uh, and people say, Clubbers, yeah, you're very idealistic. It's a far stretch. I'm like, yeah, but let's stretch far and let's see what we can do. Um, and I, I also, I, I see myself um, never stop doing what I'm doing. Maybe it changes dynamics a little bit. Maybe, it, you know, change direction. But um, I, have a, I have a big belief that people are so much more than what they think they are. I have this huge belief that we are, we have set with so much untapped potential until the day that in my last day on this planet, I want to show people uh, who they are and, and, and who they can be um, and that they're so much more and that they are worthy of it. I think that's the biggest thing, that they are worthy of the changes they want, that they are worthy of the life and, and having healthy connections. So I, I, I don't know if I was very way, vague in my answer, if I'm sidestepping, but that's kind of where my heart is, yeah. And what do you see are the obstacles? Like what will happen without those healthy connections? Oh, the end of the world as we know it. Um, you know what? You're I, not the first one to say that, by the way. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I do see a lot. Uh, I, I think especially... In the context where where I live in South Africa, you know, in our environment, it feels like I already see where we are at if we don't have that. You, you know, um, it is a uh, UCT is one of our, our big universities, uh, you know, in in Cape Town, and uh, there was this video clip this this week of uh, the EFF. They are they call the Economic uh, Freedom Fighters. Um, and they are, uh, uh, I don't know which side, left or right, but they are one of the extreme political groups in South Africa, um, fighting for economic freedom, but they, the way they do it is through disruption. So they, they will typically, when the president needs to announce something, they will try to disrupt it. And, and there was this video how they just walked into the universities while the kids were, or the students were writing the exams, and they will just flip over tables, you know, and um, you know, and break stuff and just disrupt. And, and in that, I, I just see very broken connections. I just see a very broken, um, you know, and, and it's so visible. So in one sense, if, it, if the world would go down that path, then I just see a very, very more broken world, even than what I often see and experience now. Um, and, 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 and healthy connections is not just healthy connections with each other, it's healthy connections with ourselves. It's healthy connections with our environment, with nature around us. And I think if we don't have that, oh man, I can't do doom and gloom, but I want to see like, oh geez, I think the world will be in a very bad place in, in 2045, you know, uh, and not a place that I would want my grandchildren to live in. But I don't believe we are going to go down that route. I, I do believe that there's enough of us that want healthy connections and, and, and want to build it. There's enough of us to push it in the opposite direction. That, that's my belief. Um, so, Matt? Yeah, actually, you added to, to my question. Um, I was going to ask specifically, <laughs> let, let's say that the majority of people around us, not just in Cape Town, but all over the world, there's enough people. It only takes about 20 to 25%. Um, do believe in the same vision? They start adapting ways of being more connected and, uh, and, and resist the, the path that we've been in, which is separation. You know, we have to be in the houses, close everything, big gates and stuff like that. Um, so let's say that people that resist all that and slowly but surely start changing the world. And in 20 plus years from now, the world is mostly people that find the connections. And when uh, guys can come, uh, want to come in, and I, I assume it's males, but 
people want to come in and to toss tables around and all that stuff, there'll be enough people to say, hey, you know, how can we help and how can we not, you know, not let you hurt yourself? Mm -hmm. um, so it's now 2046, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, what would the world be beyond, be, besides people feeling better and more connected and all that stuff, what do you think would be the impact on the world? So there, there are so many models out there. Um, I've, I've listened to a, oh, I don't even know if it was a, was a podcast, but I also can't remember the lady's name, but just how economics could look like when we get out of scarcity mindset and we don't all just grab what's around us and we can really feel that I have enough and therefore if I have more than I need, I can give it away to somebody else, you know? And you often listen to this and you go, like, oh man, that can never work. That will never happen, you know? Or, or people will share about how they, they, how they will, you know, they will, the relationship can change with nature, that, that we can really start living more in harmony with that. And your mind goes like, oh man, I, I don't know why well, people still mine and exploit and that that could ever work. But I think to answer you, I think if we can get this, this healthy connection process going, some of these crazy ideas could actually work. If, if, if the, the nine of us on the screen, uh, you know, if we, it's, it sounds like crazy, but if I, if we just say, hey, I'm going to throw all my money in a pool with you guys. And I trust you that you would do the best, you know, and you do the same. And, and I, and you say, I'm going to go on a holiday with this money. I'm like, yeah, if you think you need it, go for it, you know. And I don't, I don't feel deprived because I know that you've got my back as well, you know. And, and now it's not about mine and yours, it's, it's ours. Um, I think we could really see a radical different world on the economic front. I even ask myself, you know, all this politics and all this who rules where and what and voting, would that even be needed? Would that even be needed that, you know, uh, that we need to vote in a certain person with a certain idea to organize us? Or, or can we just say, hey, if the connections are there, we can manage ourselves. We can come together and decide what is best. And I know it sounds so, I mean, even I'm sitting here and saying, oh, it sounds so foreign. But I believe that would be possible if I think it can be possible if we get the connection thing right. Yeah. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that um, we don't need hierarchies to guide us. Yeah. yeah. You know, that, that what we call democracy today in 100 years from now, hopefully less than that, uh, people will say, how could you live that way? Yes. You know, yes. our kids. That's what I'm saying. Right? So, Okay. So if I may, so so Cobus, um, if you were in charge of the world, okay, knowing what you know, doing what you do, how do you get people, and we've talked about this here in this call, how do you get people to change yeah. such that they could live in the world that you and Matt were just talking about? Yeah. I mean, on a very small scale, that's what I try to do. So when we when we come into a company and there's the structure and there's the CEO and the CFO and the COO and you know and this is how it works and if you don't do this, you get a written warning. If you get two, you get fired. Uh, we absolutely try to change that thinking already. And what we do find, it is a worldview shift. It is a it is people. Um, Oh man, I must actually, have you ever heard about Ricardo Semler? He's a Brazilian guy. I must actually, if you haven't, yep. then, okay, cool. Um, and so I've been studying a lot of his work. And in the beginning, I was like, this is crazy. This cannot work. And then we would start trying some of these things, you know. And, um, and, and, and to, to answer your question, um, if I <laughs> could rule the world uh, and, 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 and put this in place, I think the first thing that I will start doing is to really, really question why do we do the things we do, you know? Why do we 
do things. I, I would just start qu really questioning things and, and, and getting people to start questioning as well. Um, uh, in our companies, we have a self-management organization. We, if you phone our company now and say, can I speak to the boss? They're going to laugh and say, speak to who? <laughs> Like, who do you want to speak to? Um, you can just speak to me. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 no. I want to speak to a senior person. Like, uh, what? You know? Um, but it took us a long time to move our team there to think like that. And it often started with being so small. Now, I'm going to give you a very South African answer, a very South African answer. Or maybe I can make it slightly more American. <laughs> Pepsi, uh, the, the company Pepsi, literally bought the whole of South Africa, you know, they bought all our food brands. Uh, it's crazy. And now we sit with all these South Africans um, and the very Afrikaner, South African way. And often you find that, you know, from apartheid, you know, all the Afrikaner guys are still in these high positions and, uh, you know, very commanding. They will just say, pick up the box, put it on there. That's how the world works, you know. And then Pepsi came along and Pepsi said, hey, we just bought your company. We're going to call the shots now, but we do it the PepsiCo way. And they say, and now these people phone me and say, Corbis, you must come and help us out. And I was like, what are, what's the issue? They said, in the past, I will tell the person to pick up the box and put it down and they would do it. Now Pepsi wants me to inspire the person to put the box down. <laughs> How do you inspire a person to pick up a box and put it down? And it's such a foreign concept, but it's often on, on that level that we need to start working with these guys. And then it's, it's like, can, can we help you to help this guy to understand the value of moving the box? But that is so silly. Why would I do that? And then I'll say, well, you would do that because if he understands the value of moving the box, he will do it with excellence. Okay. If, if you just command him, he will just do it to get out of it. And so it's often to start just helping people to understand why would we do things differently? And that takes a bit. And it's often as small as, instead of telling the guy, go and dig a hole, to say, hey, there are three holes that we need to dig today. You choose where you want to start. And it's just that, like, what? You mean I have a choice? You mean I can, I'm still going to dig the holes, <laughs> but, but you give me some freedom to decide. And I think with those small movements, we can get people to take more ownership, more responsibility, um, and actually grow within themselves. So if I had to run the world, um, I will definitely on small scale really help people to to find ownership for their lives and for their selves and for their decisions um, and wherever they are at. Um, by the way, just, a, just a, a, a fun fact, fun fact, maybe you know this anyway. I did some research on where does this idea of management comes from, that someone needs to manage me. Now, now look, Rand, a dollar, uh, I mean, I think it's like, you would know, uh, Kim is like $16 for one Rand or something. No, sorry, 16 Rand for one dollar or something like that. If you want to have a, a nice holiday, come to South Africa. You can eat a lot for not a lot of dollars. Um, but in South Africa, my house, um, the, my mortgage on my house is 1.8 million Rand. And my car is about 350,000 Rand. All right, So that, that's over 2 million Rand's worth of stuff that I need to manage every day. And on top of that, I've got a 13-year-old girl that's still alive. It seems like I can actually cope with money and people, all right? But as soon as I walk into a company, now, if I want to go and buy toilet paper, you first need to get a purchase order approved by that person to go and buy toilet paper. But I manage 2 million rand every day. Um, and, and it's so foreign. And so I like, where does the thing of management come from? So we trace it back that there was an actual scientific document written. The first scientific document on management came from the guy with the name Frederick Taylor. Uh, lived 18, 90 something. I see a few heads nodding, so you probably didn't know this. But I mean, his, his main assumptions were people are stupid and people are lazy. Uh, and with that in mind, we need to think for them. We need to manage them. And if we can start getting that out of people's thinking and get into their minds that people are great 
And if they know why they're doing what they're doing, they will be phenomenal at what they're doing. And then, and here comes a frightening but uh, liberating part. Just allow it a little bit to see what happens. Oh, man, then you won't ever go back to the old way of doing. Kim, can I share one little story? Sorry, I'm aware that, the, okay, one story, here we go. So in our team, years ago, oh, well, I say years ago, about eight years ago, I really wanted to play with some of these concepts. And one, one of the concepts, Ricardo Semler, that said he kind of allows people to choose their own salaries. Or, you know, kind of, they need to do homework, but then eventually they choose their own salary. Uh, or they said that. And I was just like, no, that will never work. If you ask me now, how much do I want? I will go three times higher than you can afford. It will never work. Anyway, we agreed as a team that we want to test a few things. And one of the agreements were that what I will do is I will, um, I'm, uh, we're going to sign a contract that nobody takes nobody to court in our experiment and nobody will get fired all right that, that was the first thing so we are in a safe space and then i said there will be a few things that we're going to try out and one of those things is you can set your own salary for the next six months guys i didn't sleep for a week i like they can close us down what if these guys are all uh, i didn't sleep but anyway that was the commitment and so I remember getting like two o'clock in the morning. I can't sleep. I don't know. Like maybe this is the silliest thing ever. Maybe this is the end of my career. I sat with the, the team that we were testing on. And I wrote down every person in the team, what I believe they are worth to the company, what they are valued to the company. And the first thing that I saw was, geez, we are actually underpaying these people. They are a lot more worth to the company than what we are paying them. That's the first thing that I see. And then I said, well, if I work on what I believe that they'll work, what do I, you know, what do I hope that they're going to ask? And I said, well, if, you know, if they come back with those amounts, then that will be great. But I expect that they will go way over that. But there's one guy in our team. He's a, a very close, closer friend of, of mine still. His name is Lumko, Lumko Velapi. And Mr. Velapi, he was one of those guys that when I thought about what does this guy do, I was like, I've got no idea what he actually does. <laughs> I see him there every day. He looks busy, but I've got no idea what he does. I, I can't think about what value he brings to the company. But he has this personality that will say, I want a hundred thousand rand a month, you know, and which you know is five times more than what we would be able to afford anyway. And he's got that, that he's got the charismatic personality. So the day came, we all sit in the room. And I start asking people, okay, so what do you want? And they are, But we do this in a group setting and everybody had to say. And the first thing that I picked up is that everybody came in about 2,000 Rand less than the actual amount that I said I was willing easily to pay them. But we, I kept Mr. Velapi at the end, you know, I want him to observe what's happening because I was so afraid what's going to come out of his mouth. And so we went on and when we got to him, I said, Lumko, how much do you want? He said, uh, I don't understand the question. I'm like, no, 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 you can set your own salary for the next six months. How much do you want? He said, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. I said, what value do you believe are you contributing to this company? I'm willing to pay you that. And this is what he said. He said, you guys are paying me way too much currently. He said, I'm not doing much for this company. And it was such a moment that if we treat people like adults, if we treat them for just being them and we, we let go of the sense that we need to control them, then often we see the best of them coming forward. And if we can just let go of control, oh man, we will live in a better world. Yeah. That was a good story. Have other questions from folks? For me, you're preaching to the choir. So I, I find a lot of resonance in terms of where I'm centered and what you're describing. And I just want to share a really quick story. I was sitting across from a senior executive in a healthcare system. And I'm suggesting to him what you're proposing. And he said, yeah, but you know, at some point, you just got to tell people when to get on and off the bus. And I looked at him and I said, tell me, you tell me something. 
why would you hire anyone you have to tell when to get on and off the bus? And he was sort of like, hmm. <laughs> you know, it's it just doesn't, it just, you know, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So, so we, we have a, 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 the headquarters of a big bank in South Africa is in Stellenbosch area, which is not that far from me. And I had a meeting with the, the HR lady and I'm sitting mm. in the, what will you call it? The foyer? I don't know, the entrance place. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm sitting there and I'm observing how people walk in and out of this building, but it is a tag that they have to have and a biometric print and a, and a retina scan. And, and I'm sitting there, I'm thinking like, do they keep money on in this building? Is the vault, you know, in this building? Anyway, so HR comes along and I say, hey, so is this the place where you keep the money? And she says, no. And she said, we don't even uh, want people to have petty cash, you know, or anything, you know, in this building. I'm like, so why the security? Like, why is it so intense? And she said, she said, uh, you know, people, you know, we, we have to kind of, you know, see what, when they are coming in, when they are leaving, you know, you, you know, people. And I'm like, oh, she, uh, and I think she said, <laughs> she said, like, you know, you can't just trust people. And I said, you are HR, you are appointing these people. Why would you appoint people that you can't trust? And, and, it's so weird, our need for control, you know, and because that's all that it is. It, it's just this weird need for control. And I think that is the, someone asked earlier, what's the biggest obstacle? I think that's probably our biggest obstacle because we are so afraid that if we let go of control, that that will be the end. And yet that will be the opposite. That will be the opposite. Yeah. And we claim that is the illusion of control. That's all there is. Absolutely, yeah. Um, thank you so much, uh, Kobus. Uh, we kind of understood what we were getting into, but we didn't really understand what we were getting into when we started these videos, these talks. And one of the things that we thought we would hear was many different stories from very many different people and what we're hearing is pretty much the same story from very many different people. And one of the things you said as a description of, of the future is this thing about connection. And you also talked about uh, mindset and worldview uh, earlier. And you're describing this idea of people connecting because we've become disconnected. Yeah. on the basis of a worldview that says that we need to be disconnected because we've created systems to disconnect us, to disrupt us, to control us. Yeah. And the story you just told about the HR situation is exactly that. We're going to act like we are not responsible because you don't think we're responsible. And so my yeah. question to you is, it, it, in your experience and the work you've done, is that a, a both and? You're changing the mindset as you're changing the structures or do you have to do the structures in order for the mind change to, to change? What, what's your sense of, of? Yeah, oh, oh man, you, that, so, so even, oh, this is what I've often seen, even in a company, when let's say your senior management they go like okay guys we're going to do things differently i want to give you more freedom i want to give you more responsibility the other people just still, still sit, sit there and go like just tell us what to do and, and so it's, it, it, it is such a weird dynamic because i was uh, i spent time with this uh, co company in this week and as a team the team leader decided that they're going to do things differently and the team super excited about this new way of doing and then it didn't happen. And they just fell back in the old pattern. And so now everybody's sitting complaining with me, like, you know, she said that we're gonna do it. I'm like, guys, you are seven. She is one. You all agreed you're gonna do it. Why do you not keep her accountable? Oh, didn't even think we can. <laughs> and, and, and so there is definitely something that as we work with the mindset, I think the, the, the structure would need to adapt, 
But when we can bend the structure, then the mindset also, you know, it is, oh man, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. Uh, but I think you actually said it well in just your question. I think it's a definitely a both. Um, let me give you an example. Yeah, maybe this is a good analogy. I cannot say to the team, hey, we are changing. Um, we we want to trust each other more. But the system still check people's bags, security, you know, when they leave. Because the system would need to change as we shift our mindset. But we can let security go and people will still not trust each other as well. So it's definitely that I think they are moving together all the time. And, it, and the big question I think is the whole time is, does the, the way we organize ourselves fit the belief we want to create? And does the beliefs we create really fit the way we organize ourselves? And if we can keep them in sync, I think we will see that world. Are oh, we going to see that world? You know? we, we, we will get there. We will get there. Thank you. We've I'm reached sorry. the end of the hour, and I, some people may need to go, um, and um, especially Colbus because of the hour. We're, we're, we're after hours here. For him. <laughs> but um, I wanted to point out, Ken just posted something you might be interested in, uh, a, a link uh, designed from trust uh, that looks like it um, applies to what you just were talking about. This is my friend, Jerry Mikulski, whom some of you on the call know. Um, he's got this uh, idea about how to design from trust. And there's a video on there of, you know, the, the oh shit, you can't design from trust and because there's free riders, they'll take advantage of us. But the percentage of those are very, very small. You know, um, the Rand Corporation did not do us any favors in the 50s when they pro promulgated the idea of the tragedy, the commons and the prisoner's dilemma because owner Ostrom pointed out that the commons actually worked very well. There was tremendous social pressure to um, to take care of the commons for everybody, not just take what you can get. And the prisoner's dilemma only works if you play at one time because if you have to interact with people over time, the soon as you screw them, they'll say, I'm not playing with you anymore. So, you know, we do have to have this sense of we're going to trust each other and we're going to work together. And those who don't will very quickly be excluded. And uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, their genes won't get in the pool in, in the pool anymore. So we'll breed them right out of us. You know, there's a, a, a third leg to the stool, Mark, you mentioned, you know, new systems for the, the changed underlying belief shift, but there's a third, there's sort of a negative space involved in this stuff too, which is um, the, the, the leaders slash management um, get woke and they unleash the hounds. You know, you have 200,000 global employees and you just yanked every center of orientation they have lived by under the yoke for five years, 10 years, 20 years, and there's no recognition to support and help them heal and recover from the trauma of what was and reawaken and expand into their own power, agency, voice, authority, capacity. And that's a sunk cost thing that's never factored in tra these transformation initiatives. It's because that has no nexus with profitability. It's a pure human need thing. Yeah. Cobus, have you seen, have you worked with or observed the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa? Yes, I mean, uh, observed from a point of view of just reading all the time about it, you know, and, um, you know, and on television and so on. Um, so very aware of the process. And I was a, a, a big fan of the work of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Um, but uh, there was a, um, I, I read the book, oh, if you ever want to read a cool book on drama, on, 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 drama, on trauma. Um, it's a book, uh, by, it's, it's called The Body Keeps Score. Um, and, and yeah, that's brilliant. And uh, that guy, he, um, he, he really spent time with the Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission. So it was so great to see from the inside what they have done. But I was pretty much just like, a, I want to say, an observer from the outside, just being aware of what's going on now. So what you're in, so having observed it, though, what is your insight? I actually feel unqualified to even answer. But, but what, what, I've, what I've really seen 
Desmond Tutu got right was to lead people in these honest conversations. And it's kind of getting away from uh, pretending. Uh, that was a big thing, you know, about looking, uh, you know, seeming that we are doing the right thing or seeming, you know, uh, it, was, it was to break through that into a very honest, honest conversations that they had. Um, and I think, yeah, I really had the gift to do that. And that is something that is completely missing in, in and the world that I see, you know, with these structures is these real honest, honest conversations. And I, and I think if, if that can become part, if that's the one thing that I will take out of the Truth and Recon Reconciliation Commission um, and bring into places of trauma, I mean, that, that will be a game changer. Yeah. We've touched on, you, you know, worldview, um, power dynamics, but changing the way people think um all of this is part of the part of the puzzle but you've got to give people i think a a lattice work a superstructure to hang a new value system for their brain well a good starting place would be that fearless child start with giving people their fearless child again yeah either back or or if they never had it because they were grown grown up in fear i mean that's the whole yeah right uh, so so Carlos, I'm going to give you the last word and then we're going to call it um, yeah. an end. Yeah, I, I guess I guess my last word would be uh, from my side, it will just absolutely be that um, the things that we are talking about is maybe closer and more doable than what we think, you know, and, and often people put it out there as crazy and idealistic. But I think, I really believe that it's maybe not so far-fetched and that it's more tangible and more doable than what we think. Yeah. And, and I just love what you guys are doing on this platform. Absolutely love it. Yeah. And thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so Good. much. Have a wonderful weekend and I'll see you in a few weeks. Awesome. Looking forward to that, Kim. Bye. Take care.